Welcome to the debate. I'm your host, Sana Makbul, with you and PTV World. In today's show, we will be talking about two very important topics and one, of course, something that is of serious concern to the country and something that Pakistan has been facing for quite some time now. But unfortunately, it seems that uh, it does not uh, seem to be getting enough attention as it should have or as it was earlier. Of course, this is with regards to the devastating floods that have impacted the country in which a huge number of people have been impacted. We know that the death toll has risen beyond 1700 including many children and we also know that currently we're dealing with a food and health crisis uh, which is uh, still increasing and then we also have uh, the looming winters on board as well and so uh, because of all of these issues including uh, the uh, loss of livestock the damage to crops and the kind of suffering that we've seen on such a massive scale this is a catastrophe that Pakistan alone cannot deal with. It's something that we have been reiterating at various platforms. Uh, as, uh, as we speak to the international community, uh, the Prime Minister and the Foreign Office both have repeatedly talked about climate change justice to be given to Pakistan and not just in terms of what is going on right now, but also what needs to be done in the recovery and rehabilitation phase as well. The current estimates uh, of loss and damage have been put at 30 billion, which of course experts are saying is very very underestimated and we'll be getting the real assessment as the water levels recede but focusing more on what really needs to be done with regards to climate change justice at the moment there seems to be some sort of uh, effort lacking in terms of actually collecting the funds that have been pledged. We know that the UN flash appeal has been increased to $860 million. Uh, and this is, of course, encouraging. But at the end of the day, we only have a commitment of about $90 million at the moment. And so far, the collection of these pledges is even low. And it seems perhaps that, unfortunately, um, the priority is currently being given um, across the board within Pakistan to uh, other political matters rather than these devastating floods that require our attention. What we're going to do in terms of those pledges, how we're going to focus on the collection, how are we going to be able to translate that responsibility, uh, that urgency that we have been repeating at every platform, uh, every chance we get into actual change and efforts for our people who are suffering right now. That is going to be the question and what, of course, our political leadership and our lawmakers need to be doing about it because it's unfortunate that just twice this week alone, uh, this uh, debate with regards to the flood situation was not uh, able to was not able to be held in the National Assembly due to lack of quorum, and this of course points to the fact that there needs to be um, a, a, a revisiting of the prioritizing of in regards to what really is going on and what needs our attention the most. So our first segment is going to take a detailed analysis of the flood uh, efforts going on at the moment and what needs to be done in terms of the collection of the international community and handling this crisis which is also increasing day by day. Our second segment is going to focus on another very important issue and threat that Pakistan has been facing for quite some time now, has been dealing and has paid a huge price for. Uh, with regards to terrorist activities in the country, Pakistan, of course, has had a lot to do in terms of controlling this menace at home. But we've seen that since the Afghan regime came into power in Afghanistan and the U.S. troop withdrawal happened, there was, of course, an, a, a threat with regards to regrouping and, of course, uh, the soil in Afghanistan being used against our territory. And then there's, of course, also the TTP. And now we've seen, unfortunately, that it seems that this group has been infiltrating within other parts of Pakistan as well, especially Sawad, in which we have seen um, numerous terrorist activities, including most recently a school man that was targeted by militants. And because of this, we've seen that huge protests have been going on by students and teachers in Sawad. And now many more have joined in as well. And this points towards the larger responsibility uh, that our government and our leadership has in terms of dealing with this this particular menace as we see that the talks with the TTP seem to be going nowhere. This is something that Khwaja Asif talked about and said that they will be using every measure. They want to be using peaceful measures, but they will resort to any other measure that is required to deal with this threat. He also reiterated the fact that this is, of course, something that Afghanistan and the Taliban regime in Afghanistan need to be mindful of and also facilitate in terms of what needs to be done. Uh, but with regards to the negotiations going on with the DTP, he mentioned that there is no outcome yet. However, this, of course, is an issue that needs national effort and a collective response in terms of dealing with. So what Pakistan uh, options does Pakistan have at the moment and what needs to be done with regards to what is going on in Samad and elsewhere at the moment and if this threat can possibly spread to 
to other areas, what plan do we have in mind? So that is going to be our focus in the second segment of the show today. For this and more, as always in the studios, uh, we've been joined by Senior Analyst Roger Fessel and we welcome Senior Analyst Farooq Patafi back from his long trip to Kawada. We missed him and glad that he's in the Thank studio you. with us today. We've also been joined by Dr. Danish Mustafa, Professor in Critical Geography, King's College London. Thank you very much, Dr. Danish, for joining us and being a part of the debate. And let me start with you, Dr. Danish, considering, of course, uh, the kind of effort that has been put into uh, talking about the kind of urgent measures that are required with the re response that is needed, not just uh, from a local level, but also from an international level in terms of climate change issues and bringing in loss and damage in this conversation within the larger discourse around the climate change issues. This, of course, has been something Pakistan has been talking about in the aftermath of the devastating floods. However, it seems now that perhaps the response in terms of actually getting together the kind of resources that were needed or pledged is not really happening. Where do you think this problem seems to be stemming from? When we talk about loss and damage, of course, in the larger sense, it was uh, missing out from this conversation earlier. Is it because of this transition is happening or is it because there is a lot in terms of the local responsibility of the Pakistani leadership that doesn't seem to be bearing fruit? Well, I think, uh, it, uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, program. I think it could be both. In the first instance, you just mentioned at the beginning of this, uh, in, your, in your introduction to the problem, that our National Assembly cannot find a quorum to discuss this problem. Yet, we are asking the taxpayers in the global West to fork out the money to help us out. The irony of that is right there for everyone to see. I, I don't yeah. think I, I need to elaborate on what's going on <laughs> with that. Second thing is that what is, you can wait for the international community to find a conscience. You can wait for the international community to find a sense of justice. Or you can, what is what needs to be done right here, right now, in order to help the poor people who are there sitting in inundated lands in sin. And the question arises, what is it that they need? What they need at the moment is, water purification pills. What the need at the moment is anti-malarial uh, medicine. What the need at the moment is latrines, uh, sanitation uh, facilities, which would keep any further spread of disease. What the need at the moment is utensils. What the need at the moment is food. Uh, food supply to be supplied but, to. Uh, Dr. Danish, <laughs> doesn't all of these things actually require the resources that we're trying to obtain? How much resources do you need for water purification pills? Hmm. Right. How, much, how much resources do you require to provide anti-malarial drugs, which are freely available in the market? How much resources do you uh, require to provide dal, uh, to provide uh, spinach, to provide uh, any sort of a locally uh, comestible food? Uh, right. Uh, Dr. Saab, so yeah. you are saying that, uh, sorry to cut you, but you are saying uh, that uh, the, the reconstruction of their lives can wait. Right now, only we, we should be content uh, at uh, actually providing them basic necessities. Sir, at the moment, you have an inundated land. You need to drain Yeah, but that. there is an institution which is working to take care of those matters, but their which houses are gone, their livelihoods are gone, most of their regions are gone. So uh, is it not prudent to also focus on how to actually rebuild their lives? By all means you do that. By all means you do that. Of course you have to. But you have to rebuild their lives if they're alive in the first instance, right? Yeah. They have to live till the time that the water is drained and they actually get to the place to be able to go back to that house. If they're not alive, then the house doesn't arise. The need for that doesn't arise. Right? Yeah. So that is what I said, that you can wait for the West to move, right? Yeah. That's your choice. You can do that. We can't do anything until the West finds a conscience, until the Western taxpayer, who's already dealing with inflation, who's already dealing with many, many other issues, to say, oh my God, our historical behavior was really, really bad. We really need to do some climate justice over here and compensate Pakistan, which is a fair and just demand. I'm not contesting that it is not a fair and just demand. But meanwhile, what happens to the people who are already sitting there? Hmm. <clears throat> So, Dr. Danish, uh, do you uh, believe that obviously we are uh, waiting for the West uh, to, uh, you know, bring in or pour in money? But before that, 
uh, as you have earlier mentioned that uh, shouldn't it be good that we must have a political consensus on uh, how to provide relief to people who are affected by the floods if we look at uh, you know flood relief campaigns of course almost all of the political parties they are running their campaigns and <coughs> within the civilian sectors they are peop there are people who are uh, running their campaigns of course army is doing its best it is utilizing its all resources to uh, provide the relief uh, to the people <coughs> but still it is not enough isn't it right when i say that uh, when it comes to you know providing to people or reaching out to people it requires uh, a hefty amount and that hefty amount, of course, right now, it can be either, uh, you know, generated through uh, the campaigns or it can be provided by the West. So in both of cases, number one, should we have a political consensus that whenever we talk about floods, no politics is being played? And number two, uh, the West, they need to hurry up because Pakistan, uh, you know, alone, it can't do enough. No, not merely West, by the way, hmm. the entire world, yeah, the uh, entire affluent world. part of the world, right? Hmm. Uh, but uh, Sana, let record show that I would also want to respond uh, hmm. to this question once Dr. Saab is done. Yeah. Sure, absolutely. Right. Dr. Saab, go ahead. So what was the question? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, the question, the question Sorry. was, of course, <laughs> we so should have a consensus. <laughs> So you can ask for political consensus. Yes, everyone should be nice as well. Everyone should be very sensible as well. The reality mm. is that natural hazards all over the world are political events. Mm. Opposition always makes hay, always points out that it's a problem. It's not just a Pakistani problem. It happens in India. It happens in Peru. It happens in Bolivia. It happens in the United States. It happens everywhere. So that's mm. just going to happen. Mm. So you can wait for the political consensus as well. What I'm trying to drive home over here is the urgency of the matter. There are people dying as we are having this conversation. There are yeah. children dying as we are having this conversation. So yeah. either we can score point, make our pious pronunciations about, you know, let there be a political consensus. Let West have a sense of urgency. Yeah. While your National Assembly does not have a sense of urgency. While your own politicians do not have a sense of urgency. Yeah. While your, so for heaven's sakes, I think that I don't know which, which stratosphere we can live in to expect that someone in Washington is going to care about people in Mitki or uh, in, in Chicago mm -hmm. while people in Islamabad don't. Hmm. So Absolutely. Do, do, Dr. And that's, that's correct. And, just, and we'll, just we'll come back to Dr. Yeah. Danish Faisal, but let us take the same question from uh, Farooq. And Farooq, right. you can mm -hmm. add to what Faisal uh, had said earlier. But I want to also add in, do we really need political consensus on this issue also in terms of actually moving forward? Is there actually not already a consensus that there needs to be uh, uh, an effort uh, to for towards our side, from our side towards what's going on? Right. What's There's the no consensus about? Uh, right, uh, right, Sana, uh, 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 one, I totally agree with what Dr. Saab is saying mm -hmm. regarding international communities' uh, response. And of course, it can be, first of all, we have to show the world and our own people who are suffering uh, that we have to take responsibility. Mm. Regarding consensus, I've seen only one consensus so far. There are 50 channels. None of them is reporting on floods. Oh, yes. uh, there are so many political parties, 13 political parties in government, but mm. yet we haven't seen the quorum, you know, uh, complete quorum in the parliament. What does it tell you? It tells you that if there is consensus, it is a consensus about obfuscation. Hmm. Uh, 50 channels only obsessing about one man called Imran Khan and not thinking about uh, 33 million of our own uh, kith and kin who are totally <laughs> left out uh, uh, for the elements to uh, take care of, right? Hmm. Uh, but uh, regarding the capacity and the institution, I, I, I think yesterday also I mentioned one thing. I, I pointed out that there is uh, this uh, body called uh, NF, uh, N, uh, um, uh, NFRCC, which is basically a flood relief body, and it actually takes care of uh, the people. And uh, we were given up, uh, you know, presentation. I told you about that yesterday yeah. as well. And they have granular data where exactly what kind of things are needed, yeah. clothes if they are needed, 
uh, if medicines uh, they are needed. And uh, you know, I totally get that anti-malaria medicines mm. might be available in the market, mm -hmm. but there are umpteen other medicines which were not. And yet, uh, thanks to our friends like Turkey, we, were, we managed to actually import those medicines as well. Mm -hmm. And yet, my money also keeps on trickling in. The only concern that I was pointing to, and I still continue to do uh, at this moment, I believe, uh, as uh, uh, I don't know whether you have noted, uh, noticed it or not, uh, ye uh, yesterday, last night, mm. there was uh, you know, um, a meeting between Isaac Dar and IMF. Yeah. IMF actually put out the statement <laughs> that we are still waiting for the, the exact thing that I mentioned yesterday. That was World uh, Bank uh, led uh, uh, report mm. uh, of assessment. Once it comes out and we have a final figure, all the Western institutions, all major institutions, all uh, you know, uh, major countries of uh, uh, part of the Committee of Nations will actually contribute whatever they can. So mm -hmm. I'm not disheartened, and nor was NFRCC about these issues. They kept on saying that the biggest problem was that internal mobilization, mm -hmm. which had started at the start, has stopped. Uh, that means that people are not actually donating more money, people are not donating more uh, stuff that is needed, right? Uh, especially the aid in kind. And because of that, perhaps our focus must be on this issue once again. Unfortunately, when your media, 50 channels, are totally obsessed about nothing, uh, do you honestly think that you can convey this message to the people of Pakistan that your brethren actually need all the all this support if we are not going to take care of our own who, is? who else is mm. Mm. absolutely yeah. Yeah. yes yeah, yeah. Uh, sana i just wanted to uh, go to uh, once again dr danish mm. i really like his name because my younger brother's name is danish okay. and uh, uh, dr danish are we you know we have very high hopes obviously from uh, uh, the world but at this, at, at this hour, when we are seeing that the world itself is facing so many crises, one of them, of course, is Ukraine war. It has created further crises within Europe, especially in Eastern Europe. Energy crisis is in, in front of us. And then there is a huge food shortage, which is being seen in Africa as a content. Uh, can we say that this is the hour we might not see the world to be generous, generous enough to look at Pakistan and we having high hopes is a wrong step forward? And I so, so love this question because it is such an effective own goal, mm. right? Uh, <laughs> while you are telling the world, okay, you are mm. so busy, don't care about us. Dr. Saab, your answer. Well, on the one hand, the people I, I live in London. I go to my local ATM, and on the ATM, there's an advertisement going for a, a Pakistan flood appeal, right? Right. By Action Aid, by Oxfam, by all of these organizations. Most of those organizations abandon Pakistan for whatever reason. But they're going to collect that money, and they're going to channel it to whoever they're going to channel it to. I don't know how that's going to work. But on the ATMs here in London, there's a Pakistan flood appeal happening. So individual private citizens are donating. Hmm. On the other hand, uh, hoping for the world is a very problematic thing. Hmm. Ultimately, we have to take care of ourselves, right? If someone steps in to help us out, that's very kind of them. Hmm. Sit there and hope is humiliating. I mean, as a Pakistani, would be quite humiliated to think that my entire country, my own nation, my government is hoping for someone else to care about our people. That is outrageous, at least to me as a Pakistani. <laughs> meanwhile, yeah, but meanwhile, as I'm saying, on every mm. ATM here in London, there's a Pakistan mm. flag on part of people that got chased out of Pakistan for whatever reasons in the past and what have you and whatnot. Uh, they, are, they are individuals who are donating. Tomorrow I'm going to Tate Gallery and I'm going to make a speech in front of Extinction Rebellion regarding Pakistan uh, floods and what needs to be done and how in, uh, climate justice needs to happen. Day after, I'm going to Cambridge University to give a lecture on the climate uh, justice and on, uh, and on questions of uh, uh, flood relief in Pakistan. The, uh, today, I have finished a two-hour podcast with the uh, uh, British Teachers Association regarding the Pakistan flood appeal and climate change and all of that. 
I've done all of those things. But the point is that it, it, just, it just breaks my heart. The country of 220 million that calls itself a nuclear power is hoping that the West will come and save it. Serious? But doc, Dr. Danish, Dr. Danish, can I uh, uh, can okay. I intervene in terms that uh, maybe Pakistan is not hoping for the aid, but hoping that the sense would prevail and we will get the climate justice, sir? But the issue remains, of course, that uh, is, is the effort at home matching or is proportionate to the effort that the international mm. community is doing, yeah, right? Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Sir, the international, the climate justice is not going to happen. You think that the rich and the powerful of the world, I mean, let's not get into the whole story of colonial transfer of resources from global south to the global north, why the global north became what it did. I mean, I teach development here at King's College London, you know. We know all of that story. Mm. But for asking the international community and the international taxpayer to grow a conscience, you can wait for that. You can hope for that. Carry on. No one is stopping you from doing that. But meanwhile, what needs to be done is well within your resources, well within your reach. What is lacking here is the will in the first instance, and secondly, perhaps even the brain power. I do not understand that in order to help the people sitting on the roadside, sitting on berms, I mean, drainage. All of that water is not draining because all this canal and RBOD infrastructure is not allowing water to drain. They know exactly where the water needs to be drained. That, do you expect the West to give you shovels to do that? To do that, everyone knows what needs to be done. It's not being done. Why is it not being done? Right, and um, Dr. Danish, another uh, issue, of course, is with regards to when we take a look at the kind of efforts that are being done at home. Um, is also the fact that when we talk about Pakistan contributing less than 1% to global carbon emissions, yeah. it has a lot to do also with the size of the economy than just the fact that this is what the percentage is of Pakistan contributing. And that, of course, puts in a lot more responsibility and accountability at home that perhaps we're shying away from. When we take a look at the previous um, uh, floods or previous climate change disasters as well, we then also call them unprecedented. Um, and of course, this is a, a much different scale, but that, that was a, a, a very massive scale at that point, and it was unprecedented, uh, unprecedented then. Have you seen any efforts, uh, if we compare to what we have done in the past, especially since 2010, if, we, if that can be used as a comparable, as to moving forward in terms of planning or preparation of future climate change issues or scenarios at home, and then also in the way that we actually deal with such crises when it occurs in terms of the strategy and response units, because there was a lot lacking in terms of the way we were coordinating our response as well. But have you seen any emphasis or any progress from perhaps 2010 to now in terms of how we are dealing with climate change issues at home? And Dr. No. Saab, if I can add to this, uh, I wanted to know that uh, because we don't know what exactly is going to be the frequency yeah. of these flood, whether it is going to be an annual thing, whether it is going to repeat uh, in four or five years, or whether it is not going to repeat at all. The question is what we are going to do to take care of the matter. So uh, as you pointed out, drainage and all, can you actually uh, you know, point to any study or set of recommendations where uh, there, there might be proper solution to our flood woes? Sir, so you had unprecedented floods in 1956. You had unprecedented floods in 1973. You had unprecedented floods in 1988. You had unprecedented floods in 1992. You had unprecedented floods in 2010. You had unprecedented floods in 19, 2022. And you're going to have another unprecedented floods, mm -hmm. right? And I answered the first question right away, no, nothing has changed in the first instance. Mm -hmm. Second thing is, when it comes to study, I, d I wrote the Pakistan uh, Flood Protection Plan for UNDP in 2013. I don't know where it went. It's there. Yeah. Who wants to see it? You know, it's there. You see, your water establishment has an acute case of what I call a mega, mega projectivitis. Yeah. <laughs> mega projectivitis is a very deadly disease that is afflicting your water establishment. That there, uh, there is a problem is in Sindh. Solution it for it will be uh, thought of in Germany, designed in Netherlands, financed in Washington. That is the problem. And the problem is that unless it involves millions of dollars, your water establishment doesn't want to talk about it. And every solution that I wrote in the water plan, and there are many others uh, that have been written, 
they don't see the time of the day because there's no money involved in those. All that requires is common sense. Today, in your water establishment, in your water establishment, there's probably not a single process geomorphologist. There's probably not a single hydrologist. 100% of them are civil engineers who happen to have found a job at Wabda, who happen to have found a job at uh, irrigation department, and 30 years later, declare themselves water experts. This uh, uh, professor of mine at MIT, who uh, supervised my PhD, not at MIT, at another place, he said, well, Danish, if Pakistanis are so concerned about water, why don't they devote resources to creating world-class centers of excellence and research on water? What kind of water research comes out of Pakistan? All that comes out is basically engineering. Mm. So unless it's an engineering solution, Pakistani water establishment doesn't want to hear about it. Mm. And the world has moved on. The world has moved on. Today, solutions are being offered by the Pakistani water establishment, which are 80 years old, 70 years old. You know, I mean, the, the most latest thinking that you can think of is at least 60 years old. And when you talk about contemporaneously, all sorts of nonsensical notions about, oh my God, you know, we need to develop, we need to do this, we need to do that, we need to be as bad as them. You said 1% of the Pakistan, uh, 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 responsible for the 1% of the emissions. Have you noticed how hard we are trying to, uh, yeah. to change that? By building yeah. DHAs and barrier towns and uh, uh, signal free corridors and uh, all of these uh, coal fired uh, plants and overheads and everything, encouraging everyone to get into an automobile, trying to, re uh, trying to repeat every sin of the West. Right. Be Absolutely, sir. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. I, I totally get your frustration, your concern yeah. about what is being done and what is and not. And my anger as a Pakistani. A anger also, it is quite visible, <laughs> by the way. Uh, and uh, I I'm glad that it is visible because yeah. that helps in making a very crucial point exactly. that we need some kind of change. Mm -hmm. But regarding, uh, you know, drainage and all, uh, you were talking about center of excellence. When the, the brain drain happens, I'm talking to a brilliant Pakistani who's yeah. sitting abroad, not in Pakistan, then we are going to make do with whosoever we can call uh, a water expert here, right? Uh, regarding drainage, I mean, in this program, we have come across two opposing uh, views. On one side, we have heard people who were supporting mega projects and they kept on saying there's nothing wrong with your drainage system. There were others who kept on saying drainage is uh, essential, especially in south of Pakistan. Yeah. And then, the, of course, what we witnessed in Balochistan where we had some rudimentary infrastructure, the way it actually got swept away. So is there a possibility of making sustainable, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, establishing uh, uh, sustainable infrastructure, which is not mega project, but a simple project? Of course there is. And let me get back to your, uh, uh, your comment about being Pakistani living abroad. Yeah. People ask me, should I come back to, uh, should I not come back to Pakistan? I say, absolutely not. I say, they say, why not? Because I'm going to die. I want to live, right? Okay. When you talk about academic freedom and all of those things, you know, you need an ecosystem within which you are able to say these sorts of things that I'm able to say sitting here in London, right? It's not like that I don't like my country. I love my country. I'd love to be there if there were circumstances which would allow me to be there. But that's by and by. Let's not go there. This is PTV after all. So we don't want to get too crazy here. But when it's a question of uh, uh, drainage and all of those things, you have to make do with the experts and everything. Today, the, you are able to talk to me, right? I'm invited by universities all over the world. I'm invited by think tanks all over the world, almost never by Pakistan. Okay. okay. The universities have invited me to talk to, uh, talk to them. Why do I have to run away from there? Why do my graduate students don't want to go back? That's a separate question as to why they don't want to go back and what. And you know, for us academics, it's not about money. Yeah. It's about it's about it's about having an ecosystem, uh, freedom of thought, freedom of expression, freedom of uh, uh, academic freedom. Mm -hmm. Do you have academic freedom? Can you offer me academic freedom in Pakistan? I'd be happy to come. But there's also, of course, also uh, issues such as what you were earlier saying, Dr. Danish, with regards to what you d did in terms of the work with uh, UNDP, that 
it hasn't really materialized and uh, seen the light of day. That's also another issue because when we talk about the kind of uh, input coming in from experts, there is also uh, the, the, the issue of actually translating that into action. So if we don't even have that, that's another area that perhaps needs to be looked at why perhaps the UNDP or other organizations relevant uh, to such efforts were not able to make use of the uh, data that was provided by you or other experts for that matter. And, and uh, uh, I just wanted to clarify with your permission, Sana. Uh, Dr. Saab, I did not mean to uh, try to uh, put you on a spot. That's okay. <laughs> um, uh, sir, with due respect, m uh, my point was that earlier you were criticizing whosoever is called uh, an expert in Pakistan. And mine was a mea culpa. Uh, I just wanted to actually justify that whosoever is here is at least trying their level best to find I'm out. I'm always at your service. I'm always at your service. Yeah. I'm talking yeah. to you here at, at 6 in the evening on a Friday evening. Uh, yeah. You know, I'm always there for you, and as is every other Pakistani that you care to talk to. But that's beside the point. I'm not trying to blame you either. I mean, that's just, just that's just the way. Let's let's just let's just not go there. But the important part about UNDP, I I ask you, I ask you, when 2013, when I was I work, I did this work with UNDP, and I think it still continues to be the case, by the way. All the salaries of the NDMAs and PDMAs are paid by UNDP. Ask the government how much money from the wrong budget, from the Pakistanis taxation budget, are given to disaster risk reduction. Zero. UNDP pays for it. That's shameful. That is shameful. Second thing is, Pakistanis are the most generous people on the face of this earth. We have the highest level of charitable giving in the world. Eventually, why the country keeps running? Because our people, with the, with the biggest hearts, always open up their hearts, their homes, their wallets, everything to help each other out. Mm -hmm. And that is what eventually saves us time and time again. Mm -hmm. I think it is time for the state to step up, step up and, and, and show itself to be worthy of the people that it lords over. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. Very just, quickly, just, just, yes. just a very quick uh, uh, question from Dr. Mm. Danish. The last one I'll uh, ask. Mm. Dr. Danish, when I visited uh, Baluchistan and Sindh last month, I talked with people out there, and uh, we are just trying to assess uh, the flood. And of course, the initial relief is being given to them, but majority of them, they said that our livelihood was obviously on the livestock. We had a couple of buffaloes, we had a couple of cows, and that's how we were uh, running our lives. Do you think that uh, uh, in coming future, of course, the mammoth challenge would be to rehabilitate them, number one, and rehabilitate in a way that they have a sustainable sort of uh, you know, livelihood as well because they have lost their livestock? You see, I've said this before, ultimately this is not the job of the federal government to provide water buffaloes to people. Mm. And it is not the job of the international community to find you water buffaloes. They don't have water buffaloes here in Europe or in America, right? <laughs> you only have water buffaloes in Asia yeah. or, uh, or cows or, or goats or whatever it is. Yeah. I wish that Pakistan had a functional, empowered, sustainable local government infrastructure. It doesn't. All governments, for one reason or another, have always undervalued and undermined local government infrastructures. Local people have the best possible knowledge for who needs help locally. Eventually, it ends up being neighbors and communities helping each other out. And that's what ends up happening. Government, most of the times, at least in the Pakistani parlance, and certainly the provincial governments and the federal governments, end up being more of a hindrance and a problem rather than actually a help in this instance. So in terms of uh, sustainable, people have a lot of ingenuity. People have been through a lot of problems. People have been through a lot of floods. They know how to deal with them, and they will deal with them. The job of the provincial government and the federal government in the absence of local governments is to at least not get in their way them up any whichever way they can and the local and the and the pakistani people will help them they always do they, they always, always have. have absolutely thank you very much dr danish for joining us thank and being a part much. of the show today and for your very candid and heartfelt conversation
It was a pleasure having you on the show. And of course, there's so much that is needed to be done at home with regards to, of course, our people who are suffering right at this moment as we speak. There's much that the international community must do and that we need to follow up with, but there's a lot of accountability that rests at home as well. Our second segment is going to focus on another issue that if uh, Pakistan has been facing for quite some time now, that is with regards to the, uh, the, the terrorist activities and the spike in them in the recent past, especially since the U.S. troop withdrawal about a year ago. Unfortunately, we've seen that despite the operations that were conducted within Pakistan, we've seen a resurgence in areas such as Sawat uh, in Pakistan. And that, of course, uh, meanwhile, the negotiations with the TTP are going nowhere. Faisal, when we take a look at all of the situation, of course, there is this really uh, big hope that something should come out of our conversation with the TTP. Mm. But despite that hope, we have not really seen any progress in terms of actually resolving anything. Mm. Uh, we're still um, stuck with regards to any progress in this matter. And then at the same time, we're dealing with a spike in terrorist activities and resurgence in areas which we had cleared earlier of terrorists. Mm. When we look at this entire situation and also perhaps the context of the regime in Afghanistan and the inability of the Afghan Taliban to facilitate these conversations or this matter or to protect uh, its soil from being used against Pakistan or any other territory, this puts us, us in a very tough spot. What options remain for us? Are we going to explore other areas in terms of what to do? This is what Khaja Asif has mentioned, that of course the emphasis is, the priority is peaceful means, but at the end of the day, other options are also open if that doesn't work out. How long are we waiting? Sana, very good question. And of course, if we uh, you know, start searching for the other options, then the other op options would involve uh, you know, more problems and I would believe and I would always uh, uh, you know, advocate this that uh, we remember in Qatar when uh, uh, Taliban were sitting with the Americans and whoever brokered that, in uh, you know, that uh, contract they, they pledged that their land would never be allowed to use, mm. uh, allowed to be used against any of the neighboring countries. Here is Pakistan and here are TTPs who have been hiding uh, in Kunar and uh, Nangarhar and suddenly they have started pouring in and they have started creating troubles once more for Pakistan and of course for mm. a long time uh, the terrorism uh, against which Pakistan's forces have been con continuously fighting now uh, they right. are Professor, let me just get a clarification. You say that they've been pouring in. Um, there is, of course, uh, still a lack of clarity in terms of the resurgence of militants in the in Sawat. Uh, is this something uh, that refers to people who had all who had already who were already there and had have perhaps regrouped or restarted their activities, or have they actually poured in from Afghanistan, or have they been brought in as a measure in terms of the peace activities and rehabilitation that was earlier held? Which one is it? Um, I would say that they once they started uh, obviously seeing the indications that uh, there is a chance to obviously get out there mm. and uh, go back to their own places, which obviously, Sawat, we know that uh, this is where it all initiated, the TTP initiated from there. So now what they have started doing is uh, one by one, they are regrouping. They are okay. re regrouping uh, in the mountainous side of uh, uh, Sawat and in coming days we will see that they will they will uh, of course create more troubles for uh, Pakistan and for Pakistanis but constantly we are hoping and we are wishing that the sense prevails uh, when we talk about Taliban of course Taliban need to play their role they have access to the leadership of TTP. They have, uh, uh, we remember, while they were fighting against the Americans, of course, TTP and uh, Taliban, they were hand-to-hand uh, -hand fighting against uh, the uh, Americans. Now is the chance and now is the test of right, Taliban. But, but Taliban my, being my question remains unanswered. How long we're waiting or what red line are we waiting to be crossed before we actually resort to other means? There's a once, lot that has already happened. Once for all, if Taliban are not willing, when I say Taliban, I expect from a neighboring country's regime to obviously help out uh, Pakistan as a neighbor. They need to help us out. If they can't, uh, you know, uh, sort of... Uh, uh, negotiate or make 
TTP negotiate a deal, then of course we are in uh, trouble. So and far. before before any trouble initiates, we must go towards the other options. But as I said earlier, if we try other options, of course they would carry uh, their own drawbacks. Though so right. for but now, I for now I would my only expect. Hasn't been answered yet. Mm. But anyway, when we take a look, Farooq, at this particular situation, it's of course hard to even understand when exactly that's going to happen. So it's a difficult thing to really uh, comprehend. But you, of course, have a, a different uh, opinion in terms of these negotiations altogether. Mm. So when we take a look at what is going on now in Sabat, and perhaps also the possibility that this is not just restricted to Sabat, can restrict to other areas yeah. as well. Um, and if that happens, perhaps the situation will be getting more and more out of our control. Um, if Pakistan is not looking at other uh, strategies or measures right now, do we face this potential threat in terms of actually uh, bringing in other parts of the country also uh, under the targets of the TTP or other terrorist groups as well, especially those uh, coming in from Afghanistan? Uh, right, uh, Sana, before I actually start, I want you to actually, both of you, uh, to forgive me uh, for one thing. That is, I uh, don't deliberately want to be mean, but I've, I'm tired and I've come back from a long journey. Mm -hmm. So that actually, when I'm tired, uh, actually uh, works on my impulse. Mm -hmm. uh, that is sarcastic uh, impulse. So I will be actually using a little mm -hmm. bit of that. Sure. Uh, earlier, when you may ask a very good qu question about uh, these elements uh, coming from within Sawat or mm -hmm. from outside, uh, my brother, uh, you know, here, Taja Faisal's response reminded me of a, uh, a you know, uh, a course or a, a discussion in my early school about, uh, in biology, that was about biogenesis and abiogenesis. Whether <laughs> things actually come, uh, are born from yeah, uh, dead things or inanimate objects or whether they actually, I'm sure that suddenly Savat's stones have not turned into terrorists, right? Mm. Uh, they are coming from somewhere. Uh, if uh, once we had cleared the region, of course they had gone somewhere else. Where mm. exactly would have they gone? They would have gone to Afghanistan, where else? Yeah. And uh, why are they still there? Because there is an ideological, uh, you know, twin sitting there. And uh, why are they coming back? Now this is where the question becomes murky. Yes. Mm. And I've been I'm, uh, I'm sorry that I have to say this. I don't want to actually toot my own horn. When have I ever been wrong on these issues? I have mm. been Taliban was still in uh, still not in power. I was shouting atop my voice that when they come, uh, we are not going to get any strategic depth. It is TTP that is going to get a, strat a strategic depth. And that is exactly what is happening. The TTP actually operates there freely. They come here freely. And every time we talk to Afghan Taliban, they are tell us, their brothers, brothers talk to them. Mm. And we have been helping TDP. Mm. Tell me who is going to explain to me why were all those check posts in these regions, which are still trouble, removed unilaterally without any, any information to the uh, proper quarters even to the parliament, which we actually said that we are going to consult. Hmm. Because of that, all these elements have come back. And if it was about the common people being, uh, common people facing hardship, do you think that now that the TTP is ready to set up their uh, unit check post, do you think that their life is any better? Hmm. Because Pakistani security forces can stop you, they can check you, but they will let you go and guarantee your security. They are not going to actually raid your house, ask your daughter's hand in marriage, and if they, you, uh, they, uh, you actually don't oblige, they will not shoot you. Hmm. Afghan Taliban, uh, Pakistani Taliban do exactly that. So who's going to respond to that? Hmm. And repeatedly, I mean, this is a cycle, and this is a shameful cycle that we are going through. Why is it that my people have to actually die? Why is it that I'm helping TTP even now? Hmm. Today, there was the National Security Committee's meeting, right. and I'm, I'm happy that we actually spoke about the need for actually fighting terrorism. And then there was one uh, sentence that reminded me of uh, Rahman Malik. 
I mean, nine years ago, and that was activating NATA. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many programs have we done on that subject? Yeah. Yes. And uh, uh, not one, not two, not three, not four, five governments repeatedly have been saying this. We have been saying this. Hmm. All governments have been pledging this. Yeah. Why is it that this is not happening? Yeah. How many times, Charlie Brown? How many times? Absolutely. And that, of course, is a question that needs to be answered and needs to be looked at. There is so much at stake here, and we really hope uh, that there is more action and then not just conversation with regards to what is happening. This goes uh, with regards to both terrorist activities within Pakistan and the flood situation. Thank you, Farooq and Raja Faisal, for joining us and being a part of the debate. Have a nice weekend. We'll see you Monday.